to our customers and within the organization. Uh, inspires continual improvements because we are looking at things on a regular basis, we're measuring things on a regular basis and that feeds into continual improvement plans and gives us a focus on the areas that we need to really start working on. And as we said, I think in all of these points it can help reduce costs. If we're more efficient, more effective, we're identifying the areas that can make us uh, a more efficient organization, then that will help to reduce the costs. So some top tips for metrics. First one, really work with the business. We've said this several times, we said it in the last slide as well. But if we are going to produce metrics that are meaningful uh, and allow uh, decision making, then we need to work with the business to identify the information they want out. So it's not just a case of IT providing a number of reports, there will be reports based on discussion and agreement with the business. The other thing is we need to make sure these reports enable decision making. Um, Barclay talked earlier about the traditional type of IT reporting, which was number of incidents logged and changes requested and this type of thing, which are all good and well in their own right, but they don't really allow us to start making any important business decisions. So the, the data and the metrics and the reporting we get out have to allow us to influence the way we operate and influence the way the business operates. Keep them simple, uh, it's, it's good advice for everything, but again, from a reporting perspective, we don't want to put too much into these reports. IT can sometimes get a bit hung up on making things very clever and very complex, but if it's simple and easy to understand, then we're going to re realize and get the full benefit of these reports without having to wade through pages and pages of detailed information. Uh, good enough is a good place to start. Again, IT can sometimes get hung up on making everything perfect, everything being absolutely 100% right before they actually start to use it. But what we need to start doing here is getting some good metrics out. So if we feel that the metrics and the reports are good enough to start, then let's just, let's just go with those to start with. We can refine and modify them later, but let's just start reporting and get some of that information out. And the, the final piece of advice really is, rather than producing hundreds and thousands of different reports, which we've seen over and over again, let's focus on a few good metrics. It would be half a dozen or a dozen metrics that will give us the information we need without swamping everybody with a number of reports that, that just confuses the situation. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, that was all very informative and um, lots of good detail and lots of good advice in there. I think those last points about keeping it simple and keeping them short and you know well, I think what we're seeing more of is IT organizations maybe f reporting and focusing on some very very specific but key metrics you know which could even be just about the availability of their systems at you know peak times rather than than the whole 24 hour cycle okay well we've talked today about uh, metrics about reporting about the inputs and outputs and so on uh, I'm just going to run over the main topics that we have covered in the um, in the series, and just the last set of questions as well. Just backs up, I guess. Um, one of the points about this is it, it, it's a new area for most people in IT and IT service management. Uh, again, almost half of you don't do any service level management metrics or reporting at all, which again is, you know, I, I guess from a purist viewpoint. Um, we'd think that that would be a concern, but I think the reality of it is that people are just wakening up to how to do this and how to do this well. And that's been the theme in our series is to provide a good practical and pragmatic advice, give you uh, guidance so that you, you don't need to waste a lot of time and, and you know run into the pitfalls that inevitably will come up on this. So our initial session uh, was on building a business case and that had three main areas to it in terms of understanding what the business strategy what you know having having a business strategy working with customers to understand their expectations and defining those high level business services and two themes I think that have run through it one is talk to the talk to your customers and the other one is, is you know, you don't need to spend months doing that. You can use workshops. Workshops are a great way to get common understanding quickly, um, to get momentum, to really kickstart the whole thing and, and get that going. So you need to sort of sit down and understand what's potentially possible for your business. Um, once you've understood those high-level services, you need to look at them more closely and understand what's involved in that supply chain. 
and what are the components, uh, whether they're IT or, or, or not, that there will be other non-IT elements in that supply chain, uh, people, processes, other department uh, responsibilities and so on. But to build your service catalog, you need to understand that supply chain. And as you do that, you can also look at the efficiency um, of, of those processes. So how many, if you're talking about request management, for example, how many touch points are there? Does, do we really need to have five people to, to uh, approve a request, particularly if it's a fairly standard one? Um, there's an opportunity there to improve the efficiency, cut, the, cut out the unnecessary um, steps in a process and identify areas for improvement. And then the value we, we can look at in our business case, if, if, we're, if we're looking to find investment for this, um, for a tool, or for a project, for training, etc. Um, the improvement plan has got to have business objectives and it's got to have some sense of how cost can be managed or, or, or taken out of the business. So, you know, put together a proper business ROI, not just this is something that's an ITIL, but um, have a practical plan that will show some business um, improvement. And, you know, you don't need to have Again, you want to have thousands of different examples there, just one or two areas to focus on. The, the key one, I guess, in terms of uh, service catalog is, is request management, cutting down the amount of time it takes to order and approve and deliver uh, equipment, cutting out the, the number of people that are involved. We have a ROI model uh, that we've built around this that uh, is available. If, if you're interested, you can contact us uh, and we can let you let you use that, but it, it's, it's basically identifying one or two areas where costs can be saved and that will then help you to get the program off the ground. So there's a number of different ways of, of looking at that from the business perspective. We then looked at the designing and defining services and if we think about ITO version 3 and in introducing this um, life cycle for services, the strategy phase, uh, which I guess is, is our business case and, and, and plan. Then we're talking about design, and we, we now have this concept of service design. It's not just something that evolves, we, we actually have to proactively and practically design and build our services. So we need to have buy-in and we need to have evol involvement from a number of different parties. It's not just something that IT can do on its own, and uh, you know, I, can, I can wholeheartedly say that if, if you think you can just do SLAs and service catalog uh, independently, then it's not going to there's not a great deal of chance that that's going to be successful with your business. So you need to get that involvement. Run your workshop. Um, people always complain about getting, you know, the business isn't involved or customers don't want to engage. Make it interesting. Drag them there screaming. Give them free donuts or beer or whatever just to get them along and get them in front of you to discuss what it is that you think that you deliver to them and, and, and how they might want to see those services delivered in the future. Um, that allows you then to, to define your structure. You can do that at a high level easily within a, a day. It takes a lot longer to build it, but it allows you then to build your structure and then define your services and service offerings. And We've talked uh, in detail about that in this series, uh, the difference between services and very specific service offerings like an email service where you would order an email account or a phone service where you would order or change or cancel a phone being, being the offering. The technology element in this is really important um, because a lot of the automation and cost saving and time saving is, is now able to be delivered through technology uh, from on the one hand having the user portal that you can then click through and actually initiate that process. Um, in the past, again, people have set up server catalogs using spreadsheets, but they don't, they're not, as we say, actionable. They can't actually deliver anything. The real value, I guess, out of this process now is that technology can help you to achieve that automation and achieve that cost saving. And probably the most difficult thing of all, establishing a service culture. Um, getting people to think about services and not systems, changing the way they think about what they are actually doing and delivering. It doesn't happen overnight and some people you'll never really be able to, to uh, convert, if you want to call it that, 
but it, you have to get the the culture as, as being a, a the, the um, overwhelming and pervasive culture in your organization that, that we're there to deliver services if we make cornflakes then you know IT's job is to make cornflakes IT's job is to um, write insurance policies you know I, IT's job is IT is paid by the organization that it works for to actually deliver those things and not just to be some kind of uh, organization on its own so there's a lot of information in that particular webcast about the, the design phase, how you would actually design services, how you would structure services and offerings, etc. Uh, and if you didn't tune into that one, then you can get it on demand on our website. The third session was about really how we can make SLAs uh, sing, how we can get them really successful. There's a number of elements again in that, including we had some spoof SLAs which were based on ones that we'd all experienced over the years and generally SLAs tend to be really quite negative things they're, they're all about when stuff goes wrong and you know you walk into a shop you don't the salesperson doesn't immediately start telling you about all the uh, things that could potentially go wrong with with the product that you might want to buy um, people will emotionally engage with with a product or, or an organization and then they happily will look at you know how issues are dealt with but if you tell them the negative stuff first they're not really that interested so SLAs have got to be positive they've got to be about the value that's delivered and there's a number of different tips that we've identified here start with services ask the business what they want use simple language keep it realistic and achievable and otherwise you're going to fail similarly only set up an SLA that can be measured keep them short and concise. Um, I've seen so many SLAs that look like quasi contracts or lawyers uh, statements you know generally if it's internally within an organization it can be as simple and short and informal as, as possible and the more informal the more chance people have got of actually reading them and this is a really tough one so you need to be quite resilient you need to have some really thick skin to, uh, to be able to win people over and, and make this work. And then finally, on the metrics, work with the business. I think there's, there's a theme here about working with the business, talking to the business, running workshops, getting people involved. This is all the stuff of this process. Uh, ensure that the, the metrics are used, that they actually are used to effect change, to support decision making. You know, do we need more capacity? Do we need more people? Do we, are we, do we have overcapacity? And all those things need to be, um, will use the information that comes out of your reporting. Uh, but again, there's no point doing all this if you don't actually do that. Keep them simple, good enough. We do get carried away in IT trying to make everything perfect, whereas we'll, we, we can actually be successful and cover the key areas with 70-80%. And a few good metrics is absolutely key. So. Um, just to round off, we've we've had some good feedback today. We've seen a number of um, responses that suggest that, that, that a lot of you out there don't have a lot of um, experience in doing this, but some of you are. I've got some questions that have come through. Um, do we factor human labor costs into request fulfillment costs? Um, I guess we can. It depends on your organization. Um, how do you calculate your target times if a request is waiting for a customer response for hours? That's an old chestnut, that one. Um, again, you depends on what your system can do if you can actually um, calculate the individual workflow components so that you can see when, for example, if, if you are waiting for um, feedback from the customer, that, uh, that that can be calculated and understood. Um, how to describe a service if it's provided to a few customers with the same parameters? I'm not sure I understand that, but I, I guess the, the point there being is that, you know, ultimately we.